They preached about everything and against everything. And so what we did is, oh, well, we're not going to do that in this church. And we won't preach against that. You know, <clears throat> they preach against everything, but we're just going to let it go. We're going to open up that door. And, and yet the problem is that they threw out the baby with the bathwater because they dumped everything that was still important and concerned us to holiness on the fact of those that went overboard and beyond the things that they needed to do. Amen. So we just threw it out there, got rid of it. And now we wonder why it's hard or even almost impossible to get it back. He's number seven, he says, we adopted church growth thinking without theological thinking. We wanted to become managers and, and officers and kind of figure out how we can map it in and, and fill the church up. But you know what? We threw the Bible out and we threw the word of God out. We just want to pack them in here and, and let's just do process by numbers, not, not Bible back, not, not God focused. Let's just, you know, let's turn it into a club. <clears throat> and number eight, most of all, we did not notice when the battle line moved. When we were fussing up about adding people and dropping things and getting off on the on the rabbit tracing tra trails and everything, it was the devil who began to encroach. And, and what you find is that statistics about people that went to church, well, entertainment started getting along the same lines and divorce and abortion, they started, their statistics started going, this is from the church world. This wasn't out of the church. This started happening in the church. Instead of our kids being holy and, and separated in their lives, you, you've got to talk about now teen pregnancies and, and all around the denominations of this world, everything from the world that was outside started to flood in. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> there's 43,000 denominations in North America. And I want to tell you that there's very few of that 43,000 that have really separated themselves for the purpose of God and have really hang, hung on to what it was. Holiness went out the window. The baby went out with the bathwater. Things that were used to be pinnacle and, and foundational and, and hanging on to who it is we are and what we are, well, they went by the wayside. Yeah. <clears throat> and I want you to know tonight as I read every point, every eight points of Dr. Drury's list, I want to shout to you tonight, church, that it's not going to happen here. And it's not going to happen with us. We can end up like worldly Christianity. We must remain an apostolic church. I don't care what an organization does. I don't care what a district does. I don't care what the other churches around uh, the province are doing or across the provinces. It doesn't matter. It's not going to happen here. It's not going to happen to us. We have drawn that line in the sand, and we're going to keep our eyes upon that eternal goal. We're not going left, and we're not going right. We're staying focused on who we are. And church, tonight, I declare to you, as much as lies within me and those who follow the Word of God, we are an apostolic church. Amen. See, this struggle over holiness is not new. But over the many years, it has accelerated. In the last days, because Satan knows that his time is short, he's working overtime to bring everything from the world back into the church and to suck the life out of godly people and make them look like everybody else that are ungodly. Mm -hmm. There's a German philosopher, his name is George Hegel, and he once said, the only thing that we learn from history is that we do not learn anything from history. All of the mistakes that they made back then, all the things that were done wrong, well, why don't we think, hey, if it didn't work then, how can it work now? Just like that story of that little boy, he walking down on a winter day and he seen a coiled up rattlesnake and he picked it up and he stuck it in his pocket and he was going to put it on the shelf in his shelf in his bedroom and and as he got closer to his home and his leg warmed up that snake, the snake came out of hibernation and before he even got home, the snake bit him. And as it slithered out of his pocket, he laid there grimacing in pain and grabbing his leg. He looked at the snake and said, why'd you bite me? He said, you knew I was a snake when, I, when you picked me up. Mm -hmm. A snake's a snake. If it didn't work before, it's not, you know, dropping, throwing things out the window, letting down on things that we believe. 
moving into landmarks just so we can draw people in the church, that's not going to make it. We didn't learn nothing from history. There was an organization that came to our organization several years back, I remember, at a general conference and it said, don't follow us. We lost our young people. We lost our young couples. We lost what we used to stand for. We lost our holiness principles and standpoints. We lost our identity. Don't follow us down that pathway. Well, history likes to repeat itself. Since we live in an era when nearly every denomination and end congregation is trying to accommodate our culture. <laughs> well, just let them in. Doesn't matter what they believe in. Doesn't matter who they are. Just let them bring their gods in. Let them bring their lifestyles in. Well, I want to accommodate every culture in an attempt to make what? Christianity more palatable. Well, it doesn't matter if they dress like that, they look like that, they behave like that. It doesn't matter what condition they come to the house of God in. But if we look at history, the history of the church, we could easily see how dangerous it is to leave a lifestyle of holiness in order to become a more acceptable church to the world. Look at Solomon. He's a biblical example forever and ever and ever. The wisest man. And as he had one wife after another wife after another wife, what did, they did, they brought their groves, their gods. And at the end of his day, the wisest man was the biggest fool. Mm -hmm. But he wanted, to, he wanted to please his wives. No, this is the line. That's the word of God, and this is how mm -hmm. it is. Amen. Let's talk about a man whose name is Nicholas. Nicholas was a proselyte of Antioch. He was one of the first seven deacons chosen to serve in the early church in Acts chapter 6 and verse 5. If you have that one. Acts 6 verse 5, the Bible says, And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip of Prychorus and Nicor, Nicanor, and Timian, and Pemius and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. He was entrusted with a position of responsibility and leadership. However, his dedication to the apostolic message you'll find was short-lived because according to the early writings on the heresy, Nicholas eventually backslid and he introduced the doctrine of the Nicolaitans to the church. His teaching severely abused Paul's doctrine of grace and introduced his followers to a new false freedom. Oh, you don't have to do that anymore. Ha, don't dress like that. Oh, it really doesn't matter. You know, they think God's love and, and let's just swing them doors open. And so people began to follow him. It was the easy way. It was like easy, easy pardon me, believism. And you'll find that several of the early church fathers, including Irenaeus and Hippopitus and Epiphanius and Theodoret, they mention this group and they state that Nicholas was the author of this heresy, of bringing in his lies into the church. In his writing against heresies, Irenaeus lets us know just how far worldliness of this group eventually reached. Nicolaitans are the followers of that Nicholas, who was one of the seven first ordained of the deacons by the apostles that the lives of unrestrained indulgence. In his book called The Gates Heresies, is book one, chapter 26, and verse three. They led lives of unrestrained indulgence. Whatever they chose to do, they still hung on to God, but they let her rip. In Revelation, you'll find that John listed the Nicolaitans beside Balaam, who cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. Revelation chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. Let's read that one. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication, 
so hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which things I hate. See, Balaam was unsuccessful in cursing Israel from out, from, pardon me, without, but he taught them to mix godliness and worldliness. If you have some time, sometime read Numbers. In the Old Testament, Numbers chapter 22 through 25. It says, and they cursed themselves from within. They didn't mess up their outside life. They took the things, their temple, their holy temple, and they profaned it. Mm -hmm. This same spirit was behind Nicholas's doctrine. He taught that Christians, since they were sinners saved by grace, well, they can live like the world on the outside and remain saved on the inside. Doesn't that sound familiar today? Well, I don't have to live like that in my church. We don't have to believe that in a congregation I go to. Our pastor doesn't teach that from his pulpit to us. A familiar words in the century, the 21st century in which we live. Let's look at Revelation chapter 2 and verse 6. But this how this ha thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which also I hate. You'll find in the Old Testament prophetic books there are many times when God declares that he hates something. But it's in the New Testament. Well, it's different there because Jesus tells us that the world hated him and that the world will hate us one day. That's going to happen. But the only thing that God says he hates in the New Testament is the doctrine and the deeds of the Nicolaitans. The doctrine that says it's okay to live a worldly lifestyle and still call yourself a Christian. Wrong, wrong, wrong. For it is God who still has a problem with people who despise holiness. You know, when I say I despise holiness, I'm not despising you. When I say that, I'm despising God because God is holy. You look at the families today, the young people, even in the church world. We got messed up families. We got young people. We got divorce rates in the church world growing at an exponential rate. They're, they're just messed up with what they do. They despise holiness. They kicked it out of their house. They brought the world in and the things of the world, the music and the entertainment of the world, they brought it in their house. How did I lose my child? Why did my wife run off of me? What was my husband looking at when he finally moved out and moved in with her? They're messed up. They went off track. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, let's read verse 7 through 8. <clears throat> this is just the beginning, friend. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 7 through 8. Paul writes, For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. He therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God, who has also given us his Holy Spirit. Amen. He put the Holy Ghost inside your soul. And so if I despise that Holy Spirit, that Holy God, that Holy Lifestyle, what God told me to live, I'm not despising man, I'm despising God. Mm -hmm. See, an outward standard of holiness was the first thing to go in the great falling away at the end of the first century. The outward show. But the tide of change. You ever hear this? Sin will take you further than you want to go. It'll cost you more than you want to pay. It'll keep you longer than you want to stay. The tide of change didn't stop there. A loss of holiness was soon followed by a loss of the act of real repentance. Did you say sorry? Huh. I was sorry I got caught, got my fingers crossed. Mm -hmm. it, we lost water baptism by immersion in Jesus' name. They picked up another formula. They went in another direction. Mm -hmm. We also lost 
speaking in tongues with the gift of the Holy Ghost comes upon you. We lost that. Oh, you don't need to do that no more. That's that's in the old, that's in the book of Acts. That's where it stopped. No, it didn't. It hasn't stopped yet. Amen. We lost the doctrine of the oneness of God. Oh, there's three, there's five, there's there's however, however God, many gods you want to embrace. Out went the baby with the bathwater, ladies and gentlemen, and in came false doctrine. As the apostles died, one by one, leaders with a smaller vision, with a weaker conviction, stepped in, and subtly, together, they altered their message. I've seen it in, our last, in the last 39 years of living for God in an apostolic realm of apostolic churches. I see men of God just saying, well, we don't have to do that no more. We'll cast that off and we'll quit doing that. That doesn't draw people. And people, people aren't going to like that. Let's figure out how to get them in. And, and we'll, just, we'll just stop doing stuff like that. And, and as I said earlier, make it more palatable to the world. So they altered the message. And only much later as gross doctrinal errors took root in the church, which quickly propelled her, the church, into the dark ages. For then it became apparent to many just how much was lost when it was the church that abandoned the need of a holiness in their lifestyle. Look who we were and what we are. Look what we had and see what it is that we lost. And finally tonight, to every era of church history again, I want you to hear this, church. I'm talking to the church that's online, our church family, our congregation of people. I'm talking to the Zoom team. And if you're listening to me out there tonight on the on the internet, online ways, and I'm talking to you, to every error of church history, again, I shout, not here, not us. We cannot, we will not end up like worldly Christianity. We must remain an apostolic church. Is anybody in the church tonight with me? Are you hearing me? Oh, pastor, you're just laying down the gun. You're getting all excited about holiness. No, it's not, man. I'm just telling you that we're the church of the living God. We believe what we believe. And the only way we're going to get there from here is to stay the course and to hang on to holiness and to trust God. You gotta get stirred up because you look around and I'm watching people that I know personally. They're having great growth, fantastic additions to their church. And all they got is people or a club with a taint and with a sprinkle of God. But in many ways, the most important thing they took out of that ingredient of life it's the fact that they still needed to be a holy people before God. I'm talking to you tonight about vessels of honor. Would you stand together with me? And shall we pray? Jesus, tonight we pray and we ask you that you would 